In the previous unit, we talked about how to mitigate threats. So we talked about all these different things that we can do to protect our network from all these different threats. So, so far in this semester, in this course, we talked about all these different attacks and threats against our network or possible and potential threats and tried to understand how people uh, take advantage of our networks and can break into our networks. We talked about social engineering and all that stuff. Then we talked about um, how to mitigate against those threats. That was the previous unit. So we talked about different techniques and different tools we have to help thwart those threats. In this unit, we start talking about how to verify that those mitigation techniques are actually working. So we talk about um, threat and vulnerability discovery. So after we've done all this stuff to try to protect our network, we've done the due diligence to try to protect our network. Now we start talking about different techniques to make sure that that's actually working. Right, so we install the lock on the front door. Uh, you might test to make sure the lock's working. Right, you're not going to take it on faith that when you turn the the key in the lock that it's going to work. You're probably going to you know turn the doorknob and shake it around a little bit, and make sure it's actually going to work. So that's what we talk about in this unit. One thing I want to clarify real quick is at the end of the previous unit, we talked about um, IDS and IPS, so intrusion detection and um, intrusion prevention systems. And one distinction I want to make is that. That was part of the mitigation. Uh, you know, a lot of students say, well, gee, shouldn't an IDS be talked about in our threat discovery because it's supposed to discover threats? Um, what we're talking about here is it, IDS is something that you should have as a mitigation technique. So that should be something you're using to mitigate the threat. By having an IDS, you're going to know that somebody's trying to attack the network and you'll know that you, um, that you should thwart that attack somehow or have some software that's going to automatically thwart that type of attack. What we're talking about here is um, you know, for doing threat and vulnerability discovery, that IDS is part of that overall security posture that we talked about. So the hope is that while you're testing or trying to discover possible threats and vulnerabilities in your network, some of these threats and vulnerabilities won't exist because you have an effective IDS that tells you that somebody's trying to attack the network. So uh, you can check the box and say, well, this is not as big of a threat because the IDS notified us that this was happening and we were able to prevent any further damage. So it's all part of the security posture and it's all part of the mitigation techniques, the IDS and the IPS. So I don't want you to confuse that with threat vulnerability discovery. What we're really doing with threat vulnerability and discovery is we're trying to see how susceptible all of our efforts are to additional attacks. That's the real purpose here. So let's get started. The first thing we talk about is some tools we can use um, to assess security. So some security assessment tools. Um, so it's important to know how to use the right tools and know what the right tools are for the right job and how to interpret those results. My father used to say, uh, you always want to use the right tool for the right job. Whenever I was helping my father around the house, that was always his thing, the right tool for the right job. Um, and no different here. So we want to make sure that we've got the right tools uh, for the right job. Some of those tools that we're going to discuss in this unit, in the first part of the unit, are things like protocol analyzers. We'll look at uh, switch port analyzers, also known as port mirroring and port monitoring. Um, for 802.1. Vulnerability scanners, honeypots and honey nets. We'll talk about port scanners, um, passes versus active tools. By the way, port scanner, I should clarify, uh, there's port analyzer, which is when we're talking about the physical port. That's, you know, 802.1. We're talking about uh, Mac layer, you know, the, the data link layer. We're port scanning, we're talking about the transport layer. We're talking about TCP layer um, port scanning. So, you know, the actual port numbers of services and things like that. Uh, we're also going to talk about banner grabbing, uh, and you know, I'll give you a little example of, of what banner grabbing is. So these are just some of the techniques and tools that we have in our toolbox. Now, one thing about all of these techniques, with the exception of the honeypot and the honey net, all of these techniques are also used by the attacker, right? So we're basically using the same toolbox that the attacker uses to attack our networks and our applications. We're going to use those same tools to attack ourselves or to kind of probe ourselves and see where we are vulnerable to these attacks. So kind of like our front door, you know, it, one thing we could do is uh, uh, when we put a lock in the door is try the same techniques that a thief would use to try to thwart that lock. You know, try using a bump key or something like that to try to get around uh, the lock. So we're going to talk about some of these tools in a little bit more detail. So let's start with the protocol analyzer. This is a tool used to capture and analyze traffic passing over a communication channel. So you might hear this referred to as a packet sniffer or a network sniffer. Uh, one product out there that you've probably heard of is Wireshark, um, which is a pretty common tool for, uh, for, for analyzing traffic on a network. Um, the thing is, for this to work, 
it has to be connected. So for packet sniffing to work, like a packet sniffer, network sniffers, wire sharks, for any of these things to work overall on the network, they have to be connected to a port that's configured to pass all traffic, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. Um, but you can also run these tools on a single host. So Wireshark, I use Wireshark all the time to troubleshoot networking issues. And, uh, you know, in many cases, I'm, I, I really only care about the traffic between two hosts. So I just install it on one of the hosts and I monitor the traffic as it's, uh, you know, chattering back and forth between two hosts. But you could also do this in a way where you can listen to all the traffic on the network or all the traffic in a VLAN. And we'll talk about how to do that in just a minute. Um, so a, a, a protocol analyzer or a packet sniffer can determine, um, uh, it can see the traffic that's on a specific port. Um, so you can say, let's say you suspect that there's a certain port that's being used by an application uh, or you think there's some, you know, some traffic on a machine, you can use a protocol analyzer to discover that. Um, you can see traffic going to certain IP addresses. You can find patterns in traffic. You can identify uh, systems or software that's generating rogue traffic. So one of the things that, that I've used Wireshark for is if I have programs and applications and I'm not sure if they're trying to phone home and send information back to somebody, I'll use Wireshark to figure out exactly what information a program is trying to send back. Uh, a good example is Microsoft Office. Microsoft Office is constantly sending information back to uh, to Microsoft if it's on a computer that has access to the internet. Um, it's not widely known. You don't usually think about that traffic. But if you're curious, it's kind of eye-opening to run Wireshark and see how all these different applications um, actually are you know, phoning home and talking to, um, uh, to their creators. So it's kind of neat to see that stuff. And that's how a lot of uh, threats and vulnerabilities are discovered. Um, so a lot of applications, they'll say, oh, we discovered that this application is actually sending some of your activity back to the home office for them to monitor what their users are doing and things like that. So you can certainly discover things like that with a protocol analyzer. You can also use these, if you're, if you're analyzing traffic on the whole network, you can see those patterns of traffic. So you might see that, um, you know, certain uh, hosts are constantly pinging certain addresses on the internet. You can trace that and figure out what applications or what software or what viruses and things are trying to talk to those addresses. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to, to run a protocol analyzer. So along with a protocol analyzer, the other thing we talk about is a switched port analyzer, which is the Cisco vernacular or SPAN, uh, but you'll also hear this referred to as port mirroring or port uh, monitoring. Um, sometimes in some switches, they'll call it promiscuous mode, so you can put a port in promiscuous mode. And basically what that means is that all of the traffic on the switch is going to um, is going to be shunted to, or not really shunted, but rather copied to that other port. So it'll act more like a hub. So back in the old days, hubs would broadcast traffic on every port, uh, but switches don't do that, which is great because it's much more efficient and allows our networks to be a lot faster, but it also makes protocol analyzers a lot harder to use because you can only see the traffic between you and the machine that you're communicating with through the switch. But if you connect to the promiscuous port, then you're able to see all that traffic. So, um, you know, sometimes you can put your switch in promiscuous mode so that you get all that traffic. In some switches, it's port, port mirroring or port monitoring. And again, in Cisco, it's span or switch port analyzer. And Cisco is probably, you know, has the largest market share of enterprise um, switches and routers. You want to make sure that whatever switch you're going to do this with can handle the volume of traffic. So if you've got a 48 port switch in a data center with servers connected to all 48 ports and they're all, you know, gigabit ports, that's going to be a tremendous amount of traffic that you're trying to send to that one promiscuous port if, if all that stuff is constantly in use. Um, one thing I, I do want to mention that your book does not talk about is uh, most of us these days are using virtual environments. And virtual environments, you kind of have a virtual switch in the virtual machine that all the virtual, or the virtual host rather, that all of the guests are using. So you can actually do that with things like VMware. You can actually uh, um, configure one of your virtual machines to be in promiscuous mode so that it sees all that traffic. Uh, or you can just put a protocol analyzer on, the, you know, on one of the ports or one of the uh, uh, multi-honed ports or something like that on the virtual machine, and you can analyze all the traffic on that port. And it's essentially a promiscuous port because all the traffic is going to have to go through that one or two interfaces or those teamed interfaces that are on that virtual machine. So you could also do something like that. You don't necessarily have to have a switch that supports that in a virtual environment. Although presumably you've got more than one virtual environment. So um, you know to see all that traffic, you may still need to do that. 
Um, but again, in either case, you have to make sure that you've got the uh, that your switch has the ability to handle all that traffic. It could be a tremendous amount of traffic. Uh, you can also configure this for just certain VLANs. So a lot of the Cisco devices will allow you to make it so that it's um, so that you're you have uh, you can you can analyze traffic just on a certain VLAN. So if you're only concerned with one VLAN, you can only monitor that traffic. So a couple different options for you. So that's a switch port analyzer. So the next tool we talk about is a vulnerability scanner. We'll talk about vulnerability scanning in a little bit more detail later on, but it's a program that's designed to probe hosts for weaknesses, misconfigurations, old versions. Um, this could be at a network layer, at a software layer, uh, operating system layer. So in your book, they talk about the network um, uh, or vulnerability scanners that are scanning for network vulnerabilities, which may involve port scanning. We'll talk much more detail about port scanning in just a few minutes. Um, it could be, you could be scanning for host vulnerability, which are focused on the host and can analyze the operating system. So they're, they're uh, analyzing the host environment. And then you can go one layer deeper and actually uh, do vulnerability scans on applications. So you can do application vulnerability scanning, which is uh, one common form of application vulnerability scanning is web applications. So web applications have uh, you know very similar attributes, and you can scan a web application. They have... Um, applications that can do vulnerability testing against web applications. For all of the vulnerabilities that we discussed uh, in the previous unit, we talked about, um, not the previous unit, but the unit before that, uh, we talked about um, application, um, you know, application attacks. So that would be scanning for all that stuff we talked about, like those injection attacks and things like that. So that's a vulnerability scanner. Your book also talks about honeypots and honey nets. So a honeypot is basically a server that appears to be real, but is actually fake. Uh, so there's no real data on it. And, and the point of it is a couple things. It's, it's designed to both distract and attract hat attacker. So if an attacker does discover a honeypot, they think that they've landed on the mother load. They think that, they're, you know, that they're, they've hacked an important server and they get distracted by it. And they uh, um, you know, start siphoning data off of that and doing all of their typical attacks. But we know that it's just fake data, and we can monitor that system and see how the attackers are attacking that system. Um, it's definitely a great tool for research, for IT security research, and it's also a um, good tool in a corporate network or an organizational network to um, to make sure that attackers have some place to go that's uh, you know that's not your real network. So you can also have a collection of honeypots uh, that emulate an entire corporate network, and that would be a honey net. And I think. For the most part, we see this normally for research. It's a little bit unusual, I think, to see a honey net on a corporate network. Usually, you're not going to create a, you know, a, I, I think honey pots. It's it, it's hard enough to get budget for anything for IT security uh, in most organizations to get just a honey pot. But if you went to management and said we need a whole honey net, I think they would probably think you're nuts. Um, but it's certainly an option that's out there, and it's it's a, it's definitely a good tool for uh, for research. Um, port scanners are pretty useful. So we talked about um, scanning ports or using port analyzers, which was layer two. That's where we're actually just capturing all the traffic on a specific port um, on a machine. We're talking about a physical port. But here we're talking about um, the more abstract port, the TCP and UD ports. So the idea here is that we can scan a system for open TCP and UD ports, and we can report filtering and open or listening ports. So port scanners are usually going to search uh, for any live systems, and they're going to do that without relying on ICMP packets. So ICMP, you know, most of us know the term ping, right? I'm going to ping a machine. Uh, sometimes ping doesn't work, and sometimes ping isn't very accurate. You'll try to ping a system, you'll get a uh, timeout response, making you think that that system doesn't exist, that IP address is not being used. But in reality, the system is there, you can connect to it, you just have to do so on the right port. So a lot of people, a lot of folks turn off ICMP for a variety of reasons. I usually don't recommend turning off ICMP. I know a lot of IT security people do, but I myself, I feel like ICMP is there for a reason. We might as well use it. Um, I prefer to leave ICMP packets to allow ICMP. Um, but in many cases, people turn that off, so it won't always be very accurate. But a port scanner, on the other hand, because it's connecting to individual port numbers and trying to make a TCP connection... In many cases, it will see that the host is actually online and responding to specific ports, even though it's not being very friendly on ICMP and telling people that it doesn't exist. Um, so that's the first part. It will identify any open ports on the host or on a network. So it'll find any ports that are listening. 
Um, it'll search for specific ports on the network if you tell it to. So if you say, uh, let's say you want to find all of the web servers running on your network, or you want to scan for any SN SMTP servers that might be on your network, uh, you can certainly do that with a port scanner. And that would be a little bit faster than doing a wide open port scan on every machine. Uh, you know, there's 65,000 possible ports, so it could take some time for all that stuff to you know, to be searched, especially in a really large network. But you can focus in on certain port numbers. Uh, you can also just do common ports that you know might be in use that, you know, let's say you wanted to identify any uh, computers on the network that might be running uh, SQL Server. And you know that there should only be certain machines that are running Microsoft SQL Server. You could scan for port 1433, and that would tell you if you've got any rogue SQL Servers laying around. It's also going to identify services, so specific services that are running on ports. So assuming that you know, one thing is you can never assume that just because you connected on port 80 that that happens to be a web server running on port 80. Uh, that is the standard port for web, but somebody could actually uh, be using port hiding where they're having different services listen on the non-standard ports to kind of hide what's really on that port. We do that all the time where I work. If I need to get remote access to a, uh, to a customer system, I will, uh, you know, a lot of times they'll block remote access, they'll, they'll block um, uh port 443, which is encrypted uh, HTTP because they can't uh, get it through the proxy server, right? The proxy server isn't going to be able to, to deconstruct that traffic and be able to see whether what website they're going to. So, um, And I have to encrypt because I work in healthcare and encryption is important to us. So I'll just set up uh, a different port number um, for that traffic that looks like different traffic. And it kind of tricks the proxy server because it's only looking for traffic on port 443 and I'm using a non-standard port, but really it's HTTPS. So a port scanner could answer that question. So it could say, well, I don't know why this is listening on port uh, 4443, right? Instead of 443, it could be 4443. But when I connect, it's really HTTPS is the protocol that's being used on that port. So it can answer that question for you. Oh, I'm sorry about the, uh, the window that popped up there. Um, so we could also, um, let's move on here. So ports that may be reported, um, or I'm sorry, ports will be reported as being either open, meaning that you're able to connect to those ports, or closed, meaning that you can't connect to those ports, filtered, meaning that the uh, the port scanner was able to detect that the port, um, that there's a machine that's listening, there's a system there, but it's filtering that port, or other. Uh, so some port scanners will tell you that it's been dropped, blocked, denied, etc. cetera. Um, so this is very useful for testing your firewall. We talked about baselining before in, in the mitigation, we talked about one of the things you could do is audit your firewall. This is one of those methods you could use to audit your firewall, is to do some port scan. You could port scan your firewall and see what traffic is blocked, what traffic gets denied, you know, and you could check your firewall logs and make sure everything's working the way that you've designed it. So that's basically port scanning. Your book talks about passive versus active tools. So some tools are active, uh, meaning that they interact with the target and that's something that could be detected. So a uh, intrusion detection system, for example, should be able to detect something like a port scanner because it's uh, very invasively interacting with all these systems on the network, as opposed to a passive tool, which would be difficult to detect. So an example of that might be a port scanner, because um, basically with a port scanner, you're just listening to traffic. You're passively sitting in a corner listening, and it's uh, difficult to detect that type of activity. So that's active versus passive tools. And both, of course, have their, um, have their uses. The, uh, the book also talks about banner grabbing, and I figured instead of um, explaining it to you, I could just show it to you real quick. So I, I've signed into my, uh, my Drexel account here. I should make this a little bigger for you. Give me one sec. All right, so that's a little bit better, a little bit bigger. So normally when we go to a website, so here's my website on Drexel. Uh, all of you can have your own website on Drexel. It's www.pages.drexel.edu. Um, so I set up my Dunks One account so I can use... My, uh, my Drexel homepage. And here it is, just a very simple web page that says, Hello, Robert. I think I was trying to demonstrate something for a student named Robert at some time in the past. It's been, <laughs> it's been on this for years. But in any event, I land on this web page. Now, here's the thing. When you connect to a website um, or a web page using a web browser, it doesn't really give you a lot of information about the web server itself. And you know this would certainly tell you that that address is responding on port 80, right? Because yeah, I can tell this is port 80. It's HTTP. Um, there's no modifier on this URL to tell it to use a different port number. So I know it's port 80. I know it's HTTP, but it doesn't really tell me anything else. But banners can tell you a lot more, and banners are kind of under the hood. We usually don't see those. 
But just to give an example of what that looks like, I'm going to tell net. So I'm, I'm telling that I'm SSH into the uh, Dunks one, which is the academic Unix server at Drexel, which is where these web server, you know, these uh, web pages are actually hosted. And I'm going to tell net to the web server and see what we can determine. And since I'm telling that it to it, um, I have to pass all the commands for HTTP. So I'm going to do get forward slash BCG. Oops, I kind of messed up there. So let me try again. Um, so we're going to tell that I'm going to do get forward slash tilde BCG 28 forward slash index dot HTML. That's the page that I was getting. I have to tell it what protocol I want to use, which is HTTP 1.1. I have to pass it the host parameter, which in this case is www.pages.drexel.edu. And there we go. So once I put all those commands in, and this is what the browser, so everything that you see here is what the browser is sending to the server. And then this is the response that the server is sending back to the browser. Now, when we, um, and I'll scroll this down a little bit. So when we connected to this, uh, this server from our browser, the only content that we saw was this stuff right here, the actual HTML, the payload. But all this stuff was passed to the browser in the back end that we don't see. But a port scanner would pick up on this stuff. So you can see here, we now know that, you know, a couple things. We know that Dunks1 is running uh, Apache version 2.2.17. That would obviously be something that a, an attacker would want to know. Uh, we know that it's running Unix. Um, so this gives us some valuable information, and, and we know obviously that it's a web server that responded. And we and it's not just um, um, it's not just web that we can do that with, right? So most services return a banner, and I'll show you an example of that. Let me uh, clear this. So let's try telnetting to port uh, 25, which is SMTP. So this server should be hosting SMTP, and there it is. So it is responding to SMTP. In fact, that banner tells me that. Either you're running uh, SendMail version 8.14.4 uh, on Sun Microsystems, right? So this is, you know, this if I were an attacker, I would deduce from this that they're running Solaris, and I know the exact version of SendMail and all that stuff. Um, so again, this is pretty valuable stuff for for an attacker to know. But a uh, port scanner uh, can a port scanner like Nmap would actually do this and be able to get a fingerprint on the operating system and the various versions of software running on ports. But you could do this yourself. You can go in and, and uh, uh, connect to these services and look at the banners to try to determine information about a target. So you can do port uh, or banner grabbing yourself if you wanted to. So that's an example of banner grabbing, which again, your textbook talks about that. So let's talk a little about risk. So we, we you should have already discussed um, risk in IT Security 1. Uh, in fact, in this textbook, that we're using in this course is chapter five. So in chapter five, uh, there's quite a bit about uh, about risk assessment and all that stuff. And you probably looked at this equation where risk is the threat times the impact times the asset value. So that helped you assess which risks are things you have to worry about and which things you don't have to worry about. You talked about things like um, you know the threat of a fire. Uh, you know fires happen typically every hundred years, so you can use that to amortize the loss due to fire over, you know, over 100 years to the value of the assets. And then that tells you whether or not or how much you should spend on fire suppression, for example. Um, so we do the same thing for these IT security attacks and threats to try to prioritize uh, what we can protect against or what we should protect against. So for threats and attacks, you want to consider the likelihood that an attack is going to be successful and the impact if that, if that attack is successful, so when that attack happens. And what that helps us think about is, uh, you know, if an attack is very likely to succeed, but it does very little impact, um, it might be a lower priority. So we know the attack is going to work, right? We know somebody can attack us this way, but we also know that the likelihood of a loss from that attack is very low. That might take a lower priority to another attack that has a lower chance of success but a, a truly devastating impact on IT security. So that helps us kind of, imp you know, so basically we're trying to heuristically think about these, um, about these attacks and what the real damage could be. We don't want to focus in on attacks that are low-hanging fruit, but, um, you know, because they, they're very easy to, um, to detect. They know we know that they happen all the time, but their threat to our organization is very low. So, for example, spam. Um, you know, we all know that spam is annoying, uh, and it, it is a type of attack, 
but the chances of somebody stealing our data from spam is pretty low, right? It's mostly all it's going to do is cost somebody a little bit of time because they have to delete some spam messages. So we might not want to focus all of our efforts on eliminating spam completely from the network. Obviously, we can do lots of things to reduce spam, but you know, we w- we wouldn't want to get sidetracked and focused on spam when you know. Meanwhile, there's this other threat that could result in an attacker stealing all of our data. Like maybe we're not encrypting our wireless traffic or something like that. So you want to make sure you focus in the right area. Your book talks about uh, a couple different types of assessments. There are um, three types of assessments. Risk assessment, which is a quantitative analysis of the likelihood of an event and the financial impact, which we just discussed. And then you've got threat assessments, which is the list of all the threats that exist and their potential for success against your network. And then a vulnerability assessment, which evaluates your security posture, which we've already talked about the security posture. So it objectively lists known vulnerabilities in your environment. So these are the three basic assessment types. Then the book talks about assessment techniques. So assessment techniques, these are the assessment techniques. Um, So baseline reporting is uh, establishing the current conditions. So, you know, what are my conditions right now? Uh, We talked about baselining already, right? We keep coming back to this term baseline, and we started talking about it in unit three in this course. Uh, I'm sorry, in unit two, and here we are still in unit four talking about baselining. Uh, And if you think back, baselining was when we we figure out what is the baseline of a system um, before we deploy it. So where should a system be before it gets deployed? Uh, So it, it evaluates our current condition. You know, where are we right now? Um, or what, where should we be in order to mitigate attacks? And are we at that baseline, right? So baseline reporting is saying, are all of your servers and systems at or above that baseline? So if our baseline says that all systems should be at a certain patch level for Windows, we could probe different systems and find out if any systems are missing those patches. And that would indicate that we're not meeting our baseline. Uh, so that's one assessment technique, which uh, you know would help us discover threats and vulnerabilities. Another uh, technique we talk about is code review, which is proofreading source code to identify security issues. Um, There are three types that we talk about in this course. There's desk checking, walkthrough, and automated code review. Desk checking is very simple. When somebody's writing code, and I do this all the time in my shop, if any of us or when we're all writing code, a lot of times we'll call somebody over and say, hey, I need a desk check. Before I put this code into production, I want somebody to come over and look at it. Just make sure I didn't screw anything up. Get a second set of eyes on it. Uh, we're all human. We all make mistakes. And, and in my shop, we encourage that. We encourage, you know, it's, it's part of our culture that, um, that we all ask each other to look at our code. There's always, a, it's kind of a team environment where we make sure somebody else looks at our code before it gets promoted into production. And if somebody doesn't get somebody to look at it and there's an issue, um, you know, we don't really get upset when people make mistakes when they're writing code. What we get upset with is if they made a mistake and they didn't try to get somebody to help them with that mistake or they didn't get somebody to get a second set of eyes on it. So we don't punish people for making mistakes, but what we do punish people for is when they fail to catch those mistakes because they didn't follow the procedure where you should get something desk checked. So desk checking is important. Uh, You can also do walkthroughs, which are more formal. So a more formal walkthrough can be done on uh, sets of code. And then you got automated code review, which is where you're going to uh, where you use software to go through the code and look for vulnerabilities or look for patterns in code that could cause vulnerabilities, which is pretty complex uh, software that does that. Um, I've never used software like that, and I've never worked in a shop where we've, in development, have done something like that. But I could certainly see how that would be very valuable um, for certain shops. I mean, I can tell you that I've worked on projects with upwards of 250 to 300,000 lines of code in, in, in one part of the project. And we still do desk checking and automated or and, uh, and walkthroughs to check that code. We don't really use automated, but I could certainly see in a really big software project that automated would almost be a requirement because how could you go through millions and millions of lines of code? It would be nearly impossible. Um, so determining the, the attack surface is a measure of um, of how many items are available for attack. Uh, so disabling unneeded services and functionalities reduces the attack service. So you can think of the attack service. So if you've got a system that has 50 different services running, that's a pretty large attack surface. There's lots of things that can be attacked. But by reducing the number of services running and the number of things have on that server, I reduce that attack service. I, I surface. I reduce the number of things you could do to attack that system. Uh, so that's determining the attack surface. We can do a review of architecture. So 
uh, there are standard architectures out there that help us define what secure architectures look like. One of those is OWASP, which is for web applications. That's a pretty good open source um, architecture that tells you there's just kind of best practice on how to develop and how to, how to um, architect web applications so that the secure uh, COVID is another one, and then ITIL. I have seen uh, COVID I don't see so much, but I see ITIL a lot. Um, so, I'll, you know, even if you go on Indeed.com and look at jobs, you'll see that a lot of them require knowledge of ITIL, um, you know, and understanding of those architectures. So a couple different options there for you. And you can certainly, what you could do when you're doing your assessment is you can use those frameworks, use those architecture frameworks and compare it to what you have and see if you're meeting those guidelines. See if, you're, you're, if you fit into those architectures. There's certainly no use in, in reinventing the wheel here, right? Some, you know, these organizations have already gone out and figured out what a secure architecture looks like. We might as well use it. We might as well comply with that instead of, you know, reinventing the wheel and trying to do it on our own. We can review designs. So new designs can be, so as you have new designs that are coming into your IT department or coming into your uh, applications or whatever it is that you're, that you're concerned with with IT security, you could take those new designs and evaluate against the already previously codified requirements that you've already established. So you could say, here is all of our established guidelines. Let's test this before we implement it to make sure that it complies with those guidelines. You can think of that as almost as a, as a form of baselining. So those are the various assessment techniques that we have. Another way to discover threats, and probably one of the uh, best ways to discover real threats to your network and real vulnerabilities on your network, is penetration testing, or pen testing for short. So you'll frequently hear people in the, in the business refer to this as pen testing, or they might talk about pen testers, which are the people that do penetration testing. Basically, penetration testing is where you simulate an attack from the perspective of an outsider. So you hire somebody or you bring somebody in that sort of simulates being an outsider. Generally, pen testing is best done when it's someone who's not part of your organization, when it's somebody who's coming in from the outside with a fresh perspective, and they're going to try to attack somebody who's, who's good at this, who's their, you know, their, they make a living going out and uh, doing penetration testing is, is generally best. So they're going to determine if an attacker can bypass security controls. Uh, they can have varying scope. So sometimes uh, uh, pen testers are only testing the network. Sometimes they're also going to include physical attacks. For example, they're going to test to see if they're able to break into the building or if they're able to sneak into the building or if they're able to access ports from the lobby, right? So they might, you know, basically all bets are off. They can do whatever they want to try to break into your network. They can take advantage of any, any means possible. Um, and I've actually done this before. I, I was uh, brought in on a project where we were working with a hospital. You know, I work mostly in, in healthcare. And uh, uh, I was brought into a hospital, and we were going over the IT security. We were talking about the security posture, and I noticed as I as I was walking into the facility that there was a box outside the building with an Ethernet port in that box. And I was curious as to whether it was a live jack. I plugged my laptop into it, and I was able to connect to their network from outside the building. I didn't even have to get physically into the building. I could just jack in from the outside. Um, so that was a little penetration test, right? I I reported it to them and say, okay, well, before we even talk about this pen test that, that you guys are going to be doing, um, I've already done it and I've already broken into your network before we even had the meeting. Um, you know, it was the first thing I said, well, you know, we already did it and then we got in and here's how we did it. Um, and then, of course, we did some other stuff later on. Um, they may include social engineering. So, uh, so sometimes penetration testers will also try to use social engineering techniques to get what they want. So some people will try to focus pen testing only on the network because that's all they care about, right? So they're, they, I, we just want to test if our controls in the network and the physical controls are adequate. Social engineering is difficult to control. It's, and it's, you know, I, I've, I think I've said this before in this course that uh, it's one of the most difficult things because we can't control people. Um, you know, they do what they want. And, uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, it's something that's out of our control. However, for a real good penetration test, you probably do want to do some social engineering. The only problem is social engineering sometimes is so easy that, you know, penetration testers that are good at social engineering, they're not even going to make it as far as the network attacks, right? They're going to come back and say, well, we we're able to get into the network and we did it because we called the uh, secretary and she gave us the password, right? But then you're not going to discover uh, all of the network layer uh, vulnerabilities that you might have. So, 
Um, so sometimes it is good to focus in or to reduce the scope to just the network because you know that the social engineering stuff exists and uh, and you can you know worry about that separately. But you might want to break this into um, into different pen tests to see uh, to see what those vulnerabilities are at the network layer. Although a, a good pen tester would also try to do the network only stuff uh, even without the social engineering. So penetration testing can reveal low risk attacks, um, but what they're trying, what they're going to try to show you, or what what you're going to notice with pen test is um, many low risk attacks that are sequentially exploited can become high risk in the aggregate because while certain low risk attacks are, uh, you know, while t while looked at individually, a low risk attack is not a big risk. If you take a whole bunch of these low risk attacks and string them along and string them together, they turn into a high risk because when when done in aggregate or when done sequentially, it results in a major loss or a major network breach. Uh, so that's something that pen testing can reveal, where a vulnerability tool doesn't really have that sort of human intelligence to be able to do that, to say, well, I got this far, let me try this, and now that I have this, I can move to the next step. Um, where a human sitting there, you know, poking and prodding at the network, they're going to figure that out. Um, they can test the effectiveness of staff. So if you are allowing social engineering, they can check to see if the staff is uh, is well trained in how to deflect social engineering, you can also check to see if your IT security staff uh, is effective at noticing or discovering these threats. Is the IDS going to help them do that? Do they act on those threats and actually mitigate those threats? Um, they can detect real threats that are not possible scanning and vulnerability assessments that we've discussed previously. Um, so you know, humans are very good. You know, people are very good at. Uh, getting around a lot of these controls, you know, and it's funny. I always think that the um, I've I've obviously worked in education for some time, and I always think it's funny how the uh, kids in school seem to always find ways to get around IT security. And uh, I always think that they might make really good pen testers because if you block Facebook in a high school, I guarantee you that that in a high school of two thousand students, I can almost guarantee you that within a couple of weeks, one of them is going to figure out how to get around it and get on Facebook. Uh, may, although maybe not Facebook anymore, that seems to be falling out of favor. Maybe something like Snapchat. I don't even know what kids are using these days. But whatever it is that kids like to use these days, if you block it in a high school, they seem to find a way around it uh, and and find that little chink in the armor and get through it. So uh, it seems like kids are, are are really good pen testers. Um, maybe we should start recruiting out of out of high schools. Um, you know, turn off Facebook and see how many of them can get through Facebook and and give them a contract, right? Um, so. Continue with pen testing. They can verify the existence of threats uh, derived from real-world situations, in, in, situations and attacks. They can bypass security controls, um, so they can identify missing, ineffective, or improperly configured security controls. They can actively test security controls. Um, so, for example, they can determine if controls work in real-world conditions. Again, pen testing is all about the real world. It's what real people are going to do. It's what real attackers are going to do. Do to try to get into your network or to uh, uh, get around your controls. Exporting vulnerabilities. It demonstrates the risk of a vulnerability and the viability of the attack vector. So it stops short usually of destructive activity. So usually a pen test is going to demonstrate that a vulnerability um, is an attack vector. It's going to show you how they, they got to that point. So maybe they'll put a file somewhere and say, yep, that was us. Uh, but it's going to stop short of destructing of destructive activity. It's going to, you know, you're not going to actually do an attack. You're not going to actually steal a bunch of credit card numbers if you're a pen tester. You're just going to prove that it's possible to steal those credit card numbers. The uh, penultimate subject in this unit is going to be vulnerability scanning. Um, and this is examining systems and networks for holes, weaknesses, issues before a potential attacker. Uh, does the same thing. So vulnerability scanning will test security controls, identify vulnerabilities, identify faulty security controls, and identify misconfigurations. There are non-intrusive and intrusive vulnerability scanning. So intrusive vulnerability scanning is... Uh, um, so an intrusive vulnerability scan might uh, have to change settings in machines and require reboots and all that kind of stuff, but it's going to be far more accurate than non-intrusive, which may not require those things. So two categories for uh, um, for vulnerability scanning. The other two uh, categories are credentialed and non-credentialed. 
So a credentialed security scan is when the uh, software that's doing the vulnerability scanning has the credentials to, um, to, to read settings and make changes and things like that, where uh, non-credential does not have that ability. And you might be thinking, well, wouldn't a non-credentialed be more accurate? But a credentialed vulnerability scan is going to assume that the attacker has somehow obtained those credentials, which is entirely possible, right? Um, in many cases, the, that's what makes the attack possible, is the fact that they have those credentials. So you're seeing if they can carry out the attack, or maybe what types of credentials they can use to carry out the attack. Your book also talks about this idea of false positives and false negatives. So a false positive is when the vulnerability scan tells you that an attack is possible when it's really not. And a false negative is when the vulnerability scan does not tell you about a vulnerability that actually exists. I think a false negative is much more serious than a false uh, positive. I'd rather have false positives than false negatives. Um, in healthcare, you know, one of the things we always talk about is uh, you know cancer screening for for breast cancer. Um, the thing about breast cancer screening is that there are a lot of false positives. A lot of times, they tell women that you know that there is a slight chance that you have cancer, um, even though the reality is there is no cancer. And the thought is it's better to have that false positive um, than to not tell somebody that they might have cancer uh, when it turns out that they do, and then it's too late. So um, in IT security, though, with, with vulnerability scanning, uh, if you have a false negative, that means the software didn't tell you about a vulnerability that actually exists, and it's lurking underneath, and you don't know it's there. Or you assume, you know, and that's the other thing, is vulnerability scanning might give you a false sense of security to say, well, there's no... You know, we've mitigated every possible attack that was found in the vulnerability scan, so we must be safe. And the reality is there could be um, things that, uh, that you are vulnerable to that, they, that it didn't find. And it could be for a variety of reasons. But, you know, one of the reasons is the software doesn't always know what those potential threats are. They haven't been discovered yet. And that's one of the things that, that IT security that we're constantly trying to think about. And as I've said this before, a lot of IT security isn't knowing all these different types of attacks. It's important to know all these different types of attacks, but we study these attacks so that we know how people try to uh, try to pull off these attacks. We know how people try to take advantage of systems, how they go about poking and prodding, and what their techniques are, and we try to think critically about that. Um, you know, but a vulnerability scan is not going to be able to do that. It's only going to tell us what the known vulnerabilities are or what vulnerabilities the software can detect. There's always things that are not going to be detected. So it's important to keep that in mind and not have that false sense of security that you ran the vulnerability scanning and you've done all of this work so far, so you must be 100% protected, which of course is never the case. The last thing that your book talks about in this unit is testing. So if you're going to do uh, uh, software testing for vulnerabilities, there are three types of tests and they, they call black box, white box, or clear box, and gray box. So black box, which uh, you can think of it from the perspective, you probably talked about in IT Security 1, uh, the vernacular of black hat versus a white hat. And the black hat is the bad guy and the white hat is the good guy. So if you're the black hat or the bad guy, and, um, you know, we're gonna, we can do black box testing to sort of simulate that, which is testing from an external perspective. It's basically sending input uh, to an application or a system that's being tested and analyzing that output. When I showed you injection attacks, that's essentially what we were doing. We were constructing some input, seeing what happened, and then using that to construct some additional input until we were able to, to attack the system. And that's what black box testing is. The thing about black box testing is you don't know how the system works. You don't know what the reality is. So when we talked about injection, SQL injection, you don't know the schema of the database. So it's difficult to pull off an attack. You have to try to different techniques in order to discern the schema of the database, in order to uh, properly format your SQL injection so that it actually does something useful well, or something destructive. A white hat, or I'm sorry, a white box test, on the other hand, is testing from within or with knowledge of how a system works. So think about that SQL injection attack. If you already know the schema, then testing that SQL injection becomes a lot easier because now if I know the schema already, I can assume that you know I know the table names, I know the column names, and I can try different things that I know could work as opposed to wasting a lot of time trying to determine what that schema is. Um, so that's certainly useful to do a white box testing. I also, I threw this in here, stub testing in, in um, the real world of software development, sometimes we refer to white box testing as stub testing because you're testing individual 
portions of a program. You're, you're sort of stub testing by passing information to a portion of a program and seeing what information comes back and making sure that that matches uh, what the design is or the designed capabilities or the design functionality of that software. But your book more talks about the first part, which is testing uh, with knowledge of how the system works. So, you know, having that understanding of the scheme of the database an attacker may not necessarily have. Gray box testing is sort of a combination. It's a hybrid of both of those techniques. So um, hybrid testing combines, you know, you have some knowledge of how the system works and you're going to use that knowledge to attempt some black box type testing from the external perspective, which is probably the most common way that we would test software for vulnerabilities. So that concludes this unit. I'm just going to review real quick. We, we do, uh, this is the first, this concludes the first part of this course. So uh, the part one of this course is now complete and you'll begin part two of the course next. In part one of this course, we first discussed different attacks and threats on networks and software. And then we talked about um, specifically wireless and application threats and attacks. Uh, so we talked very vaguely and broadly about attacks in the first unit. And then we focused in on applications and wireless and then uh, we got a little bit, uh, and then we, we looked at how to mitigate those attacks. So then we said, okay, we know what all these possible threats are. We know how people can attack our wireless networks and our applications. Now, what can we do to prevent that? And that's what we talked about with mitigation. We talked about different techniques to prevent those attacks. And then finally, in this unit, we talked about ways that we can discover the vulnerabilities in our network after we've done all of that work. So we've done all the due diligence to protect ourselves from attacks. So now how do we test to make sure that that's actually going to work and that there are no major vulnerabilities in our system, or at least we reduce those vulnerabilities to a minimum. So that's basically what the whole first part of this course was about. And in the second part of this course, part two, as we discussed before, we're going to talk about uh, host-based and application-based security. We're going to talk about alternative environments in mobile, how to secure mobile, and then uh, we're going to end the course with a discussion on cryptography. So there'll be two units discussing cryptography. Thank you for watching, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.